Hi everyone, thank you for joining me for this lecture on the British East India Company, a company that I happen to think is the most important company and period in British history. And I know that's a, it's an incredible call to make because we're looking at about two and a half thousand years of history. But stay with me during this lecture and I'll try and explain to you why I think the British East India Company was so important in actually shaping the way we live today. So the EIC, or the British East India Company, was locked away in 1947. It was locked away in an attic and no one ever discussed it since. And keep in mind, this was the exact year that India got independence from the United Kingdom. And I think one of the, the reasons that it's never actually mentioned in the British curriculum is because empire and colonization have become dirty words. And I don't think they should be because it's that history that made us what we are today. And I think what's also interesting is that there's a number of very important Indian writers that are actually coming about now and discussing their history and Britain's history in their country. And the other thing that's happening is, I'm pretty sure, is that Indians in the, in the UK actually wake up at some stage in their lives and they say, why are we here? What actually happened that led us to being in this particular place at this particular time? And I think what's also really kind of cool about that is that during the 1980s, Merchant Ivory, which are an incredible film company, they made some amazing films about the Raj, about empire and about colonialism. Merchant Ivory came out with these, you know, kind of fantasy films where, you know, the, you saw white men riding on elephants being followed by Maharajas and they were shooting tigers and doing all that kind of thing. But that never really happened. It might have happened for a Actually, it might have happened for a very brief period during the, the Raj. But keep in mind, the Raj only lasted for 90 years. We're talking about the British East India Company, which lasted for just over 250 years. And I can guarantee you that that never happened then, because then it was all about industrialization and it was about making money. It wasn't about colonization. It certainly wasn't about empire. That came after, you know, the British East India Company left. It was all about making money. So I'm going to start you in this adventure in Powers Castle in Wales. And most people probably think that's a really weird place to start because we're talking about the British East India Company who were involved in spices and India. But Powers Castle in Wales has more Mughal artifacts than the National Museum in Delhi, than the National Museum of Bangladesh, of Afghanistan, of Pakistan, and Iran. And although the castle is actually administered by the National Trust, all the artifacts within the museum are still held by the family that owns Powers Castle. And the important question is, how did they come to be there? How did the British East India Company start? And how did that loot? A word that we actually took from the Indian language how did all that loot arrive in Powers Castle? And I think we have to start with Sir Thomas Smythe. Probably no one's heard of him. He was an incredible entre entrepreneur who was based in London in about 1590. His father was an entrepreneur and made a lot of money. And when Thomas was you know, growing up, he also became an entrepreneur and actually doubled and then tripled his father's fortune. He was kind of like the Richard Branson of his day in London. And what he saw the value in, in the 1590s, was actually trading to the East Indies. The Dutch were already there, the Portuguese had been there before the Dutch were there, and the Elizabethans weren't. They weren't particularly savvy up until Thomas Smythe came along. But he had an idea to set up a company as an entrepreneur, and it all started because of nutmeg. Nutmeg was this incredible spice, this incredibly, incredible valuable spice um, that nowadays actually isn't. You know, you can walk into a Sainsbury's or a Weight Roses and you can buy, you know, packets of nutmeg for next to nothing. But back in the 1500s or 16, early 1600s, this was worth an absolute fortune. And if you think about this, just as an example, 10 pounds of nutmeg that you could only find in the Banda Islands, just to the west of Indonesia, would cost you one penny. One penny if you're actually buying it from the Bandanese, from these, you know, the, the people who inhabited the Banda Islands. But by the time that nutmeg, that 10 pounds of nutmeg had actually reached London, 
you could actually buy a three-story house in Chelsea. Isn't that amazing? That's how valuable it was. But the British weren't there. The British were actually buying it from the Venetians, and the Venetians were buying it from Constantinople. So by the time it reached London, it was at incredible, incredibly inflated prices. But one of the reasons why it was so valuable was because it was said to cure the plague. And in 1592-1593, one of the worst plagues, plagues had hit London, and over one-fifth of Londoners had actually died. So the only thing that would cure that, they thought, was nutmeg. So they needed to procure it. And this is where it came from, pretty much in the middle of nowhere but in islands that were actually held within Dutch territory. And you have to keep in mind as we, as we go through this, at this particular moment in time, the Dutch weren't at war with the British. They were actually allies of the British. And that's a really important point to remember as we go through. So the Banda Islands was where the only place on earth that nutmeg came from. So Smythe decided to get a bunch of his friends together, 280 of his friends uh, to start with, and he got them into Morgate Fields and into a hall, which they eventually called Founders Hall, and he had an idea from them. And he had an idea for them. And keep in mind, these are hardened English sea dogs. Now, also keep in mind, I used the word English there, the union of Scotland and England hadn't taken place yet. That didn't take place until 1707. So this was predominantly English pirates or privateers that he got into this meeting. And what he basically said to them was, guys, I have an amazing idea for you. The Dutch are actually trading into the East Indies. They're bringing back nutmeg. They're making an absolute fortune. And we need to be doing the same thing. And as an entrepreneur, what he was actually suggesting to them was that we start this up. We have a startup company idea, and I want all of you guys to put money into it. Now, I think the interesting thing about this conversation is that we actually don't know a lot about Smythe. But what we do know is that this particular talk gave goosebumps to every single person in that room. And by the end of that meeting, which took just over three hours, they had raised or they had commitments to raise just over seven million pounds. That's how convincing Smythe was. And that's exactly what they did. So they formed a company called the Governor and Company of Merchants of London Trading into the East Indies. And one of the reasons why that name was so long is because they wanted it to have gravitas. They were just about to suggest this to Queen Elizabeth I, and they wanted her to know that they were serious about what they were going to do. So that's what they called it, and that's what their logo looked like. And they were to become the most successful trading company of all time.